Het begint alweer een vertrouwd beeld te worden in drukke vakantieperiodes. De pandemie, de snel stijgende temperaturen. De zomer van 2022 is tot nu toe de warmste zomer ooit gemeten in Europa. Naar verwachting wordt juli wereldwijd de warmste maand die ooit werd gemeten. Het smeltende polijs. De oceanen zijn op sommige plekken 5 graden warmer dan normaal. En de wereldwijde bosbranden. The era of global warming has ended. The era of global boiling has arrived. Houden ons niet uit het vliegtuig. Wat dacht u toen u aankwam? Eh, lekker druk. Ook de protesten veranderen daar niets aan. Stop de pollution op de fucking plane! We vliegen alweer bijna evenveel als voor de COVID-crisis. En. Ryanair, low fares, great care. Het kost bijna niets. Escape to these incredible destinations from 25,99. Ja, ja. Kijk, iedereen weet dat je voor 59 euro niet naar Barcelona kan vliegen. En toch kan het. En dan, is, dan weten we dus ook dat er maar, dat, wie het slachtoffer daarvan is. En dat is het personeel. Want het vliegtuig kost wat het kost. De brandstof kost wat het kost. De landingsrechten zijn wat ze zijn. En dus het enige waar ze nog op kunnen wringen, dat is het personeel. En dat gebeurt. Met alle gevolgen van dien. Al in 2014 legde Yves Jorens als eerste wetenschapper... de relatie tussen de slechte arbeidsomstandigheden en vliegveiligheid. Op de luchtvaart. Want dat heeft een impact op de veiligheid. In de jaren daarna deden ook andere universiteiten dat. Zoals aan het Karolinska Instituut in Stockholm. En ook daar zijn de conclusies dezelfde. If you're afraid of speaking up or if you're afraid to for example say that you're not feeling well or that you're sick, have to take time off work, then we have a result where where the pilots start flying despite not feeling well. Haar meest recente onderzoek is net klaar en nog niet gepubliceerd. Ze ondervroeg 10.000 man vliegend personeel. En weer is het beeld hetzelfde. Volgens 66% van de piloten en 80% van het cabinepersoneel... zijn de arbeidsomstandigheden er zelfs op achteruit gegaan. We were quite um, sad, uh, I would say, to see that the working conditions had uh, deteriorated even further. Maar liefst 29% van het cabinepersoneel en 36% van de piloten meldt dat ook de veiligheid verslechtert. If you are under pressure, if you are feeling stressed, if you are fatigued, of course, it affects your cognitive functioning and again, it affects of course flight safety. If you are a bit slower in your decision making, if you're not that attentive or you have the same clear perception and so forth. So it has lots of uh, consequences. Your abilities are degraded. You feel not operating in a safe manner. It is a kind of form of instinct of survival rather than being comfortably installed. Onze bronnen bevestigen dat ook zij in de cockpit soms vechten tegen de slaap. You pray that nothing seriously goes wrong because you know in this state you will not be able to maybe get a safe outcome. Your mental or your physical faculties are reduced because you're too tired. A lot of pilots fall asleep during the flight. I found myself falling asleep during the flight. We call them micro sleeps. Well, it was maybe five minutes. We were towards the descent, but not yet descending. And a few minutes later, the cabin crew came in to just check on us and asked if we wanted something. And when she rang at the door, I woke up. Suddenly you wake up and say, well, what happened? Maybe it was for a few seconds, but it's really an awakening call. When you drive a car, you can pull over and park and then sleep for 20 minutes and then go again. On a plane, it's different. I had one case. It was very late at night and we just kind of dozed off. And all of a sudden, I realized my eyes were closed. I opened them up and I see the guy next to me also with his eyes closed. If your working conditions sort of pressurizes you or push you to do things, you will do it. So we're, it's, we are very dependent on the 
conditions in our context and we act accordingly to these uh, conditions. And if you, for example, then are afraid of if you have an, an, a typical employment, you're afraid of losing your job, um, you're afraid of pay cuts or whatever, of course, then you, you try to go to work despite, you know, you shouldn't perhaps. Je moet een uh, vlieger, een verkeersvlieger in de cockpit hebben die veiligheid bovenaan kan zetten en die die afweging eigenlijk zonder last en rugspraak kan maken. En contracten die dat dwarsbomen, die moeten verboden worden in onze ogen. Wie zou daar tegen moeten optreden? Nou, ik denk dat dat uiteindelijk de overheid moet zijn. Welke? Uh, de Europese overheid zou eigenlijk als eerste, denk ik, daar de kaders voor moeten stellen. En we Waar, hebben... Waarom gebeurt dat niet? Ja, omdat er sommige landen zijn die bijvoorbeeld belang hechten aan uh, prijsvechters, omdat ze bijvoorbeeld in hun land gevestigd zijn. Dus landen hebben verschillende belangen. Europa is verdeeld. Ja, Europa is verdeeld, absoluut. We gaan naar Brussel, waar 27 lidstaten ervoor zorgen dat bureaucratische molens traag malen. Tot ergernis van parlementariërs als Claire Daly, die zich al jaren in de materie verdiept. I think it comes back ultimately to the European Commission. They need to look at the facts and figures on this. They need to link the fact that atypical forms of, of employment are directly impacting on safety. Eurocommissaris Valian van Transport is verantwoordelijk voor de luchtvaart in Europa. We vragen om een interview, maar dat wordt afgewezen. Two weeks ago, my colleague sent you a uh, request for an interview. Can you tell me why uh, Ms. Valian is not willing to answer our questions? Uh, as far as I recall, I did send you an email after that. It was because the dates you suggested were dates where she was really on, not even in town. Okay, we can change the date to any place and anywhere uh, Ms. Valian is uh, comfortable with. So would you be so kind to reconsider that request? I need to see exactly what kind of questions we're getting. Um, that's just how this goes. It's the biggest open secret out there. This is a disaster waiting to happen. And I mean, you flagged it 10 years ago. It's a miracle that there hasn't been uh, a tr uh, really horrific incidents before now. But how long can they wing it, as it were? 50, 40, 30, 20. We ontdekken hoe sommige maatschappijen hun personeel onder druk zetten als we recente audio-opnames in handen krijgen. Daarin horen we hoe een werkgever zijn piloot niet serieus neemt wanneer hij meldt dat hij oververmoeid is en niet verder kan. Er zijn thunderstorms around. We were avoiding all day. We've been sitting waiting on an airplane for more than an hour in 40 degree heat. We were expecting another crew to be ready here to fly us back to the home. Just go and have five minutes. Have a bite to eat. Have a coffee. Sorry, I am not following your train of thoughts. You want us to go have a coffee and get a bite to eat. And then? The airline always stands by the... If you are unfit to fly, you should not fly. That's written in the manuals. But that's on paper. This is not negotiable. If someone is telling you it's not fit to continue, that's the end of the conversation. Or it should be in theory. In feite zijn mensen verplicht om zich not fit to fly te melden. Dat is dan de term. Uh, alleen als je zeker weet dat je daarmee je baan kwijtraakt, dan wordt dat een hele moeilijke keus. Want ja, ik bedoel, er moet toch ook brood op de plank komen. In mijn company there is a taboo around calling fatigue. Because everyone knows if you call fatigue, there will be an investigation. What we see is that when someone claims that it's unfit to fly then there are always consequences, always. There is always a phone call, a letter inviting for a disciplinary meeting. They will try to find why you call fatigue, and they will try to find reasons outside of the company, like family life, and they'll blame it on that. And they will give you a warning, like if this happens again, there will be measures taken. We jakkeren mensen af en brengen ze in gewetensnood, want deze mensen weten allemaal dat ze zich not fit to fly moeten melden. Het is waar oud-piloot Mike Simpkins de grens trok. I just knew I was too tired to operate. I can tell you how tired. I knew it was way, way beyond um, being safe. So that's why I refused. 
Hij wordt geschorst, terwijl doorvliegen volgens Simkens onverantwoord was. The level of fatigue was equivalent to uh, effectiveness of a drunk driver. Um, 0.08 mil of blood alcohol content. So it would have been the equivalent of flying, at, um, the equivalent of being drunk. How dangerous was it to keep on flying then, with this level of fatigue? Uh, well, not only dangerous, it also would be criminal. And that was pointed out at the trial. Simpkins vecht zijn schorsing aan bij de rechter, die hem in het gelijk stelt. The judge said, if I had operated that day, she agreed that um, the consideration it would have been a criminal act to fly when fatigued, that, so fatigued that it would uh, result in uh, safety issues. Strafbaar. En toch geven onze bronnen toe dat ze geregeld in de cockpit zitten terwijl ze niet fit zijn om te vliegen. It's absolutely shocking, but I'm not surprised. I've had an awful lot of testimony myself uh, over the years from pilots in a similar situation. Captains worried that their co-pilot is coughing and sneezing and spluttering, but won't go home because if he goes home, he won't get paid. If I say it's normal, that's probably overstating it, but it's certainly not uncommon. Ook dit willen we voorleggen aan Eurocommissaris Valiant. Maar die laat, na veel aandringen, uiteindelijk weten niet voor onze camera te willen reageren. We would really be unpleasantly surprised if nobody would answer serious questions about flight safety in Europe. I cannot guarantee you that it will be the commissioner answering, but I can do guarantee you that you will get answers. All right. If there are questions that are like under our remit, then you will get answers. I think that's really disappointing because we have a European Commission that talks repeatedly about transparency, about openness, about accountability to the European citizen. These people have an obligation to answer the public via your programme or others. You're supposed to be representing the citizens of Europe. Well, tell the citizens of Europe about your work. Account for your actions. Eurocommissaris Valian verwijst voor een interview uiteindelijk naar EASA. De Europese toezichthouder voor vliegveiligheid. Opmerkelijk is dat de organisatie al jaren vraagtekens zet bij de wetenschappelijke onderzoeken naar het effect van de atypische contracten. Nou, dat een uh, pilot who is uh, self-employed feels less secure in terms of employment uh, than uh, a pilot who is uh, a traditional employee, that's for sure. Uh, how do you translate that into uh, a safety risk? Uh, it's a perception. I have a hard time understanding it um, because um, the perception, I mean, that's the way we perceive the world. Um, if I'm unhappy, that's the way I perceive something. If I'm in pain, that's the way I perceive my pain. So reducing perception to something that shouldn't be listened to, I, I really don't understand that. That's not a perception. They've seen it happen to their colleagues. It's a reality. So this is just a cop-out on IASA's part, and it's really not good enough. Yeah, it's the pilots, and, and how else could we measure? Aren't they the ones in the position? So who knows best whether a pilot is tired? Only that pilot. Nobody else can adjudicate on that. It's very much a personal matter. Directeur Key is inmiddels weg bij de toezichthouder. Een week voor onze uitzending stemt EASA, na ruim een maand bellen en mailen, alsnog in met een interview. Op afstand met een ander directielid. In your opinion, is there a connection between atypical contracts and flight safety? Well, in fact, we don't see a correlation between uh, whatever form of uh, employment conditions and, uh, and safety. We don't see it in the, in, the, in the data, in the safety data. Er liggen stapels rapporten over de manco's en over de afhankelijkheid. En als EASA dezelfde rapporten zou lezen als dat wij lezen, dan zouden ze tot dezelfde conclusie moeten komen als wij. Zij zeggen het is vooral de perceptie van piloten. Dit heeft helemaal niets met perceptie te maken. If flying personnel by the thousands since 2014 tell you that their contracts are a risk to flight safety, how come that doesn't convince you? Well, I mean, we, we uh, the whole issue of employment, and so it's not only safety, it's also 
uh, are a struggle between the uh, employer, the airlines, and the personnel. Uh, uh, so there can be a lot of uh, factors uh, influencing that people are not fully happy. Where, uh, no, but we're, we're not talking about fully happy. We're talking about safety. And pilots do tell us, and not only pilots, also scientists and union uh, leaders, tell us there is a big risk as a result of these contracts. There is a hazard, there is a potential risk. That's true, and that's why we... So, sorry to interrupt, but so you uh, acknowledge there is a hazard, right? There is a hazard, yes, uh, because that could lead to some safety risk. We have to look at what is being reported. So that has not, that is not what the data suggests, that there should be a particular issue, concrete safety risk with these contracts. So there is no way that, you can, you, there's no way you can tackle this problem. Is that what you're saying? Well, 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 no, what I'm saying is that we are not certain that we have a problem. It's a total blind spot. It's a frighteningly dangerous blind spot. And it comes back to our earlier point that the longer this goes on, it doesn't mean that actually there's no problem. It means that the problem is getting worse. In een jaarverslag van EASA zien we dat de organisatie voor twee derde wordt gefinancierd door de luchtvaartsector. Vliegtuigbouwers, luchthavens en maatschappijen. Dat zijn hun stakeholders, zoals ze dat noemen. De mensen die zij in hun belangensfeer hebben zitten om mee te praten over wat er wel en wat er niet geregeld moet worden op het gebied van vliegveiligheid. Maar daarmee zijn zij ook niet objectief meer. Nee, ik denk dat dat niet wenselijk is. How independent would you say EASA is? We consider ourselves, and we are indeed, an independent agency. We are never influenced uh, uh, by any concrete payment going into our house in a, in a, through another channel. So if we say no, if we give findings, we do that on the basis of a, a technical view on safety and not, we don't earn any money on, on, on this. This is to cover our costs. EASA houdt toezicht op de nationale inspectiediensten in Europa. Maar met Wizz Air, de Hongaarse prijsvechter, heeft de waakhond een rechtstreeks contract om toe te zien op veiligheid. We are not compromised by having any customers. We have many manufacturers, Airbus, Dassault and so on. We have now also as a, as a new element also airlines. We have a couple of airlines. Uh, where we are competent authority that will not compromise our independence. Maar uit interne e-mails van Wizz Air, die we in handen krijgen, blijkt dat de budgetmaatschappij vooraf op de hoogte is als EASA komt inspecteren. We lezen dat de EASA inspectie plaats zal vinden tussen 5 en 8 september. In general, do you announce uh, planned safety audits? Sometimes we do, uh, but that's more for practical reasons that we need uh, some people to be uh, uh, on site when we arrive. But um, if you do, what are the odds you think your personnel will find any irregularities? Well, when we announce an audit, that is mostly for practical reasons, as I said, and they cannot, they don't have a chance in an airline that to in influence whom we are going to uh, to uh, to talk with because it's our choosing whether we would go to one group of pilots or another group of pilots so so there we feel quite confident that what they say to us without the presence of the airline in the room is what they really feel and mean verderop in de mail lezen we Hou er rekening mee dat de inspecteurs je vragen kunnen stellen die over veiligheid gaan. So you don't see that as a, as a problem? No, no. Well, it means they're not independent, doesn't it? He who pays the piper, uh, you know, it's the tune you play. When somebody finances you, you're going to give them the answers that they want to hear. Het Hongaarse Wizz Air is de snelst groeiende prijsvechter in Europa. Dit is directeur Jozef Faradi. Goed gemutst in een net aangekochte Airbus. Maar in een interne videoboodschap die we onder ogen krijgen... lijkt de vrolijkheid vervlogen. En maakt hij zijn personeel duidelijk... dat het van vermoeidheid niet zo'n probleem moet maken. We kunnen niet deze business plan dat elke vijfde persoon op de weg... rapporteert ziekte omdat de persoon 
is is fatigue. Uh, uh, we are all fatigued, but sometimes uh, it, it is required to, uh, to take the extra life. Onze bronnen, piloten en cabinepersoneel zijn verbijsterd over de video. I could expect that sort of opinion from somebody who's not working in a highly critical environment like aviation. A person who makes that kind of statement is not concerned about the safety of his personnel. The only thing that matters is the planes take off and land so money can continue to come in. Well, I thought that this is very, very stupid. You cannot say that. If he was my CEO, I would think that he doesn't care about the people he hires. And the only thing he cares about is to fly as much with little resources and earn as much money as he possibly could. Nou, dat vond ik heel schokkend. Uh, juist omdat fatigue zo'n belangrijk onder, onderwerp is. Het wordt door de wetgever wordt het, um, wordt het echt benoemd als, als een veiligheidsissue... waar we heel zorgvuldig om moeten gaan met elkaar. En daar wordt gewoon gezegd, fatigue, wat is fatigue? Ga maar gewoon, uh, ga maar gewoon vliegen. This is behavior of people who consider themselves next to God. I don't think that they have to be allowed to take any decisions... concerning human lives and everything. In my opinion... It's very dangerous. We're not selling potatoes. With all due respect for whoever sells potatoes, if we are fatigued, it becomes a safety concern. It's a risk. We are supposed to mitigate risk. So if you're tired and fatigued, you don't mitigate risk by going the extra mile. It is exactly the opposite. You should do one mile less. And hearing these things from a CEO, it's quite worrying, to be honest. We were quite surprised. Uh, now we don't know the full context of the, the video. Do you consider such a video, do you consider it a safety hazard? No, the video in itself is not a safety hazard, but uh, uh, we, we, were not, we were, were not fully uh, uh, in line with that uh, video and the message could be interpreted in the wrong way. So you a public verordeling of such a message from the EASA verwachten? Ja, dat zouden ze zeker moeten doen. We hebben het discussed this also with the with the senior management. Why didn't you do that publicly? When we are not fully happy with something, we communicate that directly to uh, to the organization. In this case, with them. Wat vindt u ervan dat zo'n statement uitblijft? Ja, dat vind ik een slechte zaak. En daarmee neem je je verantwoordelijkheid niet. We krijgen nog een opmerkelijke interne Wizz Air video in handen. Hierin beantwoordt directeur Verradi vragen van zijn personeel. Twee jaar geleden heeft een cabin crew een union in Bucharest. Ze hebben eindelijk gefeierd. Wat is jouw opinie over de employees union? Ik denk dat het ook gebeurt deze keer. Ik zou zeker niet recommenderen om dat te doen. Ik denk dat we dat beter moeten doen. Unions zijn dragen, feet down. Ze uh, zijn distractief. Uh, and you know, people may think that uh, unions protect them better, but believe me, that is not the case. Het leidt in de Verenigde Staten tot verontwaardiging. De Amerikaanse overheid geeft Wizz Air geen toestemming voor transportvluchten naar de VS. De Nationale Pilotenvakbond steunt die weigering. Vanuit een studio in de buurt van Washington legt de voorzitter ons uit waarom. Well, Alpa has several concerns with the way Wizz Air operates. It is an anti-union air carrier whose toxic culture raises labor and safety concern. Wizz Air targets pilots for termination who call in fatigued, call in sick, who will not fly on days off and will not extend their maximum duty days. So what does that tell you? Well, the Wizz Air CEO publicly showed contempt for pilots who refuse to fly when fatigued, saying in a video that everyone was tired and that pilots should just get over it. They refuse to give that license so they from across the Atlantic can see what our people here can't see. Um, that has to tell you something, that our, industry, our oversight bodies are captured, our commission is asleep at the wheel and passengers in Europe should be worried about that. De Amerikanen zetten ook vraagtekens bij de rol van EASA. Dat immers rechtstreeks toezicht houdt op de veiligheid bij Wizz Air. EASA is used to overseeing the overseers, overseeing national government aviation safety authorities, but not being the direct supervisor of an airline. EASA is inexperienced at direct safety oversight. We have additional concerns that safety issues will not effectively be addressed. How painful is such a disqualification? 
Well, uh, I'm quite sure that the Americans are not uh, are not uh, questioning the quality of the ASA oversight. They do. Basic... They do. We have spoken to them, and they do. Now, the Americans have a problem with that because their rules are formulated in a, in a very strict and perhaps old-fashioned way. I believe they are. Uh, they are about to change the rules, in fact, to accommodate uh, also EASA rules in the future. That's what the latest we have uh, heard from our American partners. So the problem is with strict and old-fashioned rules in the U.S.? That's what they told us. Uh, whether they uh, tell you something else, that's uh, on, on, on their account. Afgelopen juni organiseert EASA een conferentie in Keulen. Er is één opvallende spreker. Wizz Air directeur Faradi. Hij houdt de opening speech over veiligheid. We are very committed to safety, zegt hij. And it is puzzling that an aviation safety organization would invite someone with his track record to be a keynote speaker. But we don't... Uh, you think uh, it's appropriate? We consider Wizz Air and other uh, airlines in Europe uh, as safe airline. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, any representative of that uh, airline can also uh, do presentations at the EASA uh, seminars or, or conferences. Here we have a system where the body responsible for European aviation safety has this airline under its direct charge and only that one. Its CEO is the most blatant advocator of breaching pilot safety regulators and they not only don't sanction him but invite him as their guest speaker to their conference. Ook onze bronnen blijken weinig vertrouwen te hebben in het toezicht door EASA. You file a report about things and nothing happens. So there is no feedback from the authorities towards the company. So the company can continue behaving like that in impunity. I have filed reports on the EASA system. They just disappear. Even if you ask follow-up emails, you quote your reference number, those follow-up emails disappear. It just tells us that we are on our own. I guess in their eyes, they must be doing a good job when there are no fatal accidents. Which is also kind of concerning, because normally aviation should be proactive. It shouldn't be reactive. We should not be waiting for an accident to happen and then make changes. Even when severe issues, safety issues are put under their nose, they don't always want to see them. They turn the other way. Dat is ook een hele slechte zaak, denk ik. En dat, is, dat vind ik dan ook een beetje in het licht staan van het feit dat EASA zegt... we hebben geen data. Ja, als, je, als, je, als er al iemand durft te melden uh, en je doet daar niks mee, ja, dan, dan, ben je, dan ben je toch niet met veiligheid bezig, terwijl zij zijn de guru van de veiligheid in Europa. I do really hope that EASA becomes the watchdog they are supposed to be. I'm not saying aviation is unsafe at the moment, but there is no oversight. It's too easy for an airline to not be safe. Betekent dat dat het onafhankelijke toezicht op de Europese luchtvaartveiligheid tekort schiet? Het schiet zeker tekort. Ja, die schiet tekort. Hoe ernstig is dat? Dat is ernstig. We interviewed both pilots and cabin crew. No one we spoke to has any confidence in the way EASA conducts oversight. What are your plans to restore that trust? Well, this is not an information that uh, we have that uh, our uh, oversight uh, uh, program is uh, questioned. Uh, we believe we do a professional job. I would believe there is no question, there is no reason to question EASA's independence and professionalism in terms of safety oversight. So finally, does the public have to be concerned about flight safety in Europe? No is the short answer.